Thank you. In response to the question of why would we do chemistry or science when we know that there are more important things to do, I would say, because science is fun. <laughs> but Vipassana purifies the mind. Science can help elucidate an intellectual understanding of the world around us and within us. But Vipassana leads to the ultimate state of complete purification, complete liberation from suffering to Nibbana. So I would also agree that to make best use of our time, we should probably all sit here and meditate for the next hour. <laughs> but I think there is validity and value in pursuing some of these basic ideas. One of the reasons being when we conduct courses, we find that these questions come up. People, especially who are just beginning to get involved in Vipassana meditation, still have a lot of questions about how does this practice of Vipassana relate to other endeavors in which we engage. To begin, I'd like to read a quotation from Goenkaji that appears in the discourse summaries. He says, This is what Siddhartha Gautama did to become a Buddha. He started observing reality within the framework of his body like a research scientist, moving from gross apparent truth to subtler truth to the subtlest truth. He found that whenever one develops craving, then one starts suffering. There's a lot contained in that brief quotation, similarly to Rick's three-point path to Nibbana. <laughs> the Dhamma is such that it can be expressed in very short, pithy statements. But for most of us, it requires more explication, and that's why we come here to take 10-day courses. <coughs> the reason I read this quote is because it does refer to the Buddha as being like a research scientist. Now, this notion brought up in my mind as I do, do science for my livelihood. Well, is this just a figure of speech? Or does Goenkaji really mean, in a strict sense, that this is a science? So I gave this considerable thought myself. And my approach will be slightly different from the others in that I'm going to focus much more on the actual methodology of science and the methodology of Vipassana and see if I can chart out some parallels and perhaps formulate the practice of Vipassana in terms of the scientific method. In the very brief handout that I handed out, I, I just typed up a few ideas that, uh, that might be foreign to those who haven't taken Vipassana courses or those who haven't taken very many. I raise the question, is there a pure science? And refer to the fact that what I will do here is a brief comparison between the scientific method and Vipassana meditation. I use the word pure science because I want to differentiate from the scientific method as it's evolved in the West. I believe that this practice is very scientific but that there are some differences. And I'll elucidate those as we continue on. And just a brief outline of where we'll go in this talk. First, I will introduce a few of the basic concepts that I've outlined on the handout. Then I'll go through a very brief, superficial history of science. As Rick indicated, we have 2,500 years of science to cover. <laughs> and there, but there are some relevant highlights that I think are worth pointing out that then can be used to illustrate how Vipassana is similar to that scientific method that has evolved over time. I will then use the Four Noble Truths, which are outlined on your uh, handout for those people who haven't taken a course, 
and try to formulate that in terms of a scientific experiment. I will then proceed to discuss a few of the issues that that notion raises because, as I said, there are differences between the two approaches. That will lead into a discussion of perception, which Rene started yesterday, went into in some detail. And I will raise some of the pertinent issues again and relate those to the five aggregates, which are also listed on the handout. Pardon me for violating the rule, (laughs) but my mouth tends to get dry. The first notions that I'd like to go into are the three types of wisdom as outlined by the Buddha. Now, these are quite simple. First one is Sutta Mayapanya, which in English would be received wisdom. A good example would be somebody tells us it's possible to swim or we read in a book, it's possible to swim. Well, that's a piece of information, gives us some wisdom. We know that somebody's opinion is, it's possible to swim. But that doesn't take us very far. The second type of wisdom is chintamayapanya, or intellectual wisdom, which, as an example, would be if we ourselves get a book out of the library, say, and do some reading, learn a bit about the physical laws of buoyancy, learn the description of swimming, and intellectually, we reason out that, yes, in fact, the human body should float fairly well in water, and we should be able to flap our arms around and kick our feet and perhaps swim. But at that point, we still haven't progressed to the point where we know for a fact that we ourselves could swim, because obviously some people never do learn to swim. So the next step must be taken, that is, bhavana mayapanya, or experiential wisdom, where we get in the water, we do start flapping our arms and feet around, and then, yes, we have the experience, we do know how to swim. Now, I raise these distinctions because when we pursue science, generally, in the traditional sense of Western science, we're engaged mostly in chintamayapanya, or intellectual wisdom. We develop models of reality. They're logically consistent. They're verified by others. And that gives us a certain amount of wisdom, a certain amount of understanding. But it's in a completely different category from Vipassana meditation, which is bhavana mayapanya. Chinta mayapanya also explains Vipassana. And as you know, those of you who have taken courses, when you listen to the discourses, you listen to some descriptions of some of the theory behind what we're doing, and that helps. But the core of what you do here, this 12 hours a day, is sitting on the mat and experiencing for yourself the reality within. So right off the bat, I've created a distinct problem for myself because there's a category problem here. I'm going to be comparing apples and oranges. I'm comparing an intellectual pursuit with a very practical pursuit. However, I'll do the best that I can, and hopefully I'll convince you that there is some relationship between the two. Under the primary dualities, and I'm sorry I used words like dualities, there's nothing that's esoteric there, I just mean to point out um, opposite or opposing principles. The first one I'd like to elucidate a little bit is method versus results. A good example of what I'm talking about is the pursuit of art as opposed to a work of art. Now, quite often we see a painting on a wall and we would say, that's art. Well, art is really the process that an artist undergoes, training the talent that's used to produce the work of art. There's a difference there. In science, we have the scientific method, which is different from the results of science, which are, for example, our models of reality. Uh, You might have all seen pictures of a model of DNA. This is a quite a popular topic these days, and you see ball and stick uh, models, balls connected by sticks representing the molecule. Well, that isn't a DNA molecule, obviously. That's just a representation of how we see it, and that's, the, that's more the uh, 
uh, result of our endeavors. In meditation, of course, the actual method is the meditation, and the results are hopefully, if practiced properly, purification of the mind. In this talk, I'm going to, uh, in distinction between this talk and the other talks, the other talks talked a lot about some of the results. I'm going to talk more theoretically about the method of Vipassana and compare it to the method of science. There's another duality, subjectivity and objectivity, which is a thorny issue. I'm going to stick to a very conventional definition of subjectivity and objectivity, that being the subjective is more related to our own personal opinions and ideas, and objective would be opinions, or not opinions, but rather laws, truths, principles that are not so tied to one's own personal point of view. The reason I'll do that is because if we look at objectivity and subjectivity in a more scientific term, the way that term has been used over the centuries, and it began with the ancient Greeks, was that there is a distinct difference between the subject, that is, we as individuals, and the objective world outside. And that distinction is breaking down in the light of 20th century science. Quantum mechanics tells us that at the level of the atom, in order to conduct experiments to determine position, momentum, say, we run up against the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says we can't know both with full certainty. The more we know, say, an electron's position, the less we know about its momentum, and vice versa. The reason for that is, is that the act of conducting the experiment actually affects the outcomes. And in fact, it may be that it is impossible to not be somewhat involved in the experiment to the point where it influences the experiment, even on a macro level. There's another more philosophical way of looking at this problem. I'm going to try to stay away from philosophy as much as I can. It's not my expertise, and it's also a slippery slope where we could end up uh, speculating an, lot, an awful lot and not really making any headway. But this notion of subjective and objective gets blurred when we talk about perception because as I look at this light in the ceiling, there are actually photons coming from that light and impinging on my eye. So in a real sense, the particles from that light have entered me. I have become part of that light. That light has become part of me, and that blurs the distinction. Before we get too far, I work in an academic setting, setting so I think it's only fair to give you a homework assignment, <laughs> but a very nice one, a very comfortable one. Sometime toward the, end of the, towards the end of this month, when the weather is really pleasant, I would invite you to take a nice comfortable chair out on your deck, sit down, and gaze up at the stars. <coughs> Consider as you're gazing at the stars that the nearest star to us outside our solar system is 4.1 light years away, meaning the light that's entering your eye at that moment would have left that star 4.1 years ago, and more than likely hundreds of light years, thousands, even millions of light years ago, depending on which star you happen to be looking at. A light year, by the way, is approximately six trillion miles. So that light has come a long way. So while you're sitting there looking up at the star, try to cast your imagination off into space to that star and consider that light is composed of particles. The smallest particle of light is a photon. On the surface of that star now, as a result of the nuclear reactions that are going on, photons are being ejected out in all directions of space. And some photons are going to travel those trillions and trillions of miles in a direct line, perhaps curved here and there by the curvature of space. But they are going to do the almost impossible. Those photons are going to make it to a spot that can't even be seen from that star, and that is planet Earth. But it doesn't stop there. Those photons are going to come screaming down through the atmosphere and find you on your deck. <laughs> And more than that, they're going to make it through the tiny quarter-inch opening of your dilated pupil, because it's dark, 
And that photon, that particle that came from that star those many, many years ago, will strike the optic nerve in your eye, and you will have the experience of seeing that star. So your assignment is to simply wonder about that complex and incredible event, which makes you part of the star and makes that star part of you. And then perhaps you'll understand why I don't want to talk too much more about (laughs) theoretical aspects of subjectivity and objectivity. Uh, The last distinction I'll make before we get into the actual uh, issues involved in in trying to compare the scientific method with Vipassana is the notion of apparent reality versus ultimate reality. Now, these, these notions are very important both in science and in terms of Vipassana. In terms of Vipassana, apparent reality is what we all experience when we first come to our course, our first course. The pain in my leg is permanent. (laughs) And it is solid. Don't try to tell me it's a Nietzsche. (laughs) But the ultimate reality, as time goes by, becomes apparent to us. No, it is not permanent. It does pass, even if we only have a few moments of clarity. And it isn't solid. If we introspect, we find that at the depth, yes, there is motion going on, there's vibration going on. And in the physical world, we also have this distinction between ultimate and apparent reality. The apparent reality is the world that we live in, which could quite nicely be called a middle kingdom. In this middle kingdom on planet Earth, this marble bowling ball, as Joni Mitchell called it, We're just the right distance from the sun so that there's plenty of liquid water. There's an atmosphere we can breathe. And as a scientist, I'm very concerned about this. The classical laws of physics are obeyed. We can have an intuitive understanding of what goes on in this middle kingdom we inhabit. But that's the apparent reality. The ultimate reality of matter, for example, is that all matter is composed of very tiny particles, and that those tiny particles, we can't even possibly have an intuitive understanding of what they are. When I say the wave function that describes an electron gives you an idea of its probability of existing in space, I don't know how to give you an intuitive model to picture that. It's not a nice little billiard ball like we used to think. So... Another example, I'm going to throw in a few examples from science because I did say, after all, science is fun. So I hope I can convince you of that, that at least some of, the, some of the notions involved in science are fun. That we can consider, well, at the ultimate reality, at the level of ultimate reality, there is no real solidity. And what does that mean in terms of the atom? Well, the atom is a difficult thing to picture. As I said, the, the fundamental particles that make it up are impossible to picture. But just the sizes and relationships within the atom are astounding. To try to imagine the relationship between the parts of an, of an atom, we would have to imagine a sphere the size of a huge football stadium. And I'll tell you right off, I got this analogy from Fritjof Kopper's book, The Tao of Physics, if anybody wants an interesting read on the topic of uh, modern-day physics and its relationship to other notions, that's a very good book. If you're standing in the middle, or you had to be suspended in the middle of this spherical dome, approximately 100 meters in diameter, the size of the nucleus of the atom would be approximately the size of a grain of salt. And that's where most of the mass of the atom exists. So where's solid matter? (laughs) All that space, I won't say empty space, because we know now that there's the concept of empty space is probably not valid. But we perceive matter as being solid. Well, the electrons then that would be circulating around this nucleus would be specks of dust floating around in this huge astrodome. Now the question is, how could we possibly perceive that as being solid? Well, it turns out the electrons are moving at approximately 600 miles an hour, not an hour, 600 miles per second which means a single electron would circumnavigate that sphere 
approximately 100 trillion times a second. So if you think of the illusion created, if you look at an older type airplane with a propeller, that when that propeller is rotating, it looks like it creates a solid disk, actually a disk you can see through, but nevertheless. So we can see that at the level of subatomic particles, the illusion is created because there is such incredible velocity, such incredible motion going on. So now let's proceed to a very brief outline of the history of science so that we'll understand what the scientific method is and how it evolved. The origins of the scientific method go back to the ancient Greeks. The ancient Greeks relied a lot on deductive reasoning. They posited certain basic principles and then deduced from those principles and developed systems of logic. Wonderful example of that to show that it's, it wasn't all bunkum is Euclid's geometry. From simple notions of a point in a line, he developed a system of torture for school children down to the, <laughs> mo down to the modern age. <laughs> but in actual fact, it's, it's a wonderful achievement of logic. On the other hand, however, since we're talking about the ultimate reality of physical matter, there were two different notions at that time. One was that matter was constantly changing, always in a flow, never standing still. And interestingly enough, this is approximately the same time period as the Buddha was teaching in India, and the question must come up, did somebody hear something? <laughs> but since the first principles were up for grabs, there was also an opposing school that said, no, uh, there's a notion of a divine principle which was permanent, and all motion was illusion. So you can see there's a problem with relying simply on deductive logic. You can have two opposing systems of thought and no way to resolve at that level, at the intellectual level, between the two. It wasn't, as Rick said, until much later in the 17th century that things started to change. The Copernican Galilean revolution, as Rick called it, certainly started things rolling. Galileo not only looked through a telescope, by the way, he borrowed the idea of the telescope, he didn't invent the telescope, started observing directly nature, and started incorporating mathematics, which is, has been a very important aspect of science as we know it. That is, we, we started measuring things much more precisely, and for better or worse, that gives us some confidence in our results. Francis Bacon made probably the most significant advance in this whole evolution of the scientific method by saying that he would base all his thinking on direct observation of particulars, and he would then use inductive logic, or he would generalize from those particulars and form his theories. And that is the crux of how, I believe, the scientific method has been so successful, because it is based on reality, based on what we observe around us, and the general laws are very much valid. They may change over time, but I'd like to point out that a lot of the laws, like classical laws of motion, are still valid within their framework. It's not that they've been disproven. It's they have been found to work only within certain limits. So this idea of looking at reality, the physical reality around us, and generalizing has certainly been a powerful tool for our understanding of the world around us. Sir Isaac Newton put the icing on the cake and said, well, I'll do that, but I'm going to add the description of an experiment so that others will be able to repeat the experiment and verify for themselves whether, in fact, my theories are correct. And therein is a complete description of the scientific method as we use it down to the modern era, down to the modern times. Observation, formation of hypotheses, theories, the testing of those theories with experimentation. And there's one other 
aspect that's been added more recently, and that is peer review in the scientific literature. And I, I add that it's not necessarily thought of as part of the scientific method theoretically, but that is how the scientific method works today. And it's a, it's a distinction I will make between what we call science today and how I'm going to describe the practice of Vipassana as a science. So now I'll embark on this effort to convince you that what we practice here is a valid application of the scientific method. And I'm simply going to refer to the Four Noble Truths. And I think it's a fairly simple exercise to do this. The first noble truth is the truth of suffering, a direct observation. This is what the Buddha observed, and this is what we all observe, that this life, there is an inescapable fact that there will be suffering in it. Birth, illness, decay, old age, and death face us all. And there are other kinds of suffering as well. Not getting what we want, getting what we don't want. Great loss, whether loss of personal wealth or loss of near and dear ones. This is a simple observation of life as we know it. Well, fortunately, the Buddha didn't stop there because that would have been a rather difficult spot to leave us in (laughs) with just the understanding that this is a world full of suffering. The second noble truth, he elucidated the origin of suffering. And the ultimate origin of suffering, of course, is our ignorance, our ignorance of the way things really work. But as a result of ignorance, if you go through the chain of dependent origination, it takes you to sensation, and the craving and aversion that we develop as a result of that sensation. And as a result of that craving and aversion, through several more steps, we come to birth and decay and old age and death. So that's the first hypothesis, that there is a cause to our suffering. The second part of the hypothesis is the third noble truth. There's a cessation to that suffering. And of course... Again, referring back to the chain of dependent origination, if we remove the ignorance, if we start to observe reality as it is, and we observe that reality with equanimity, gradually the cause of our ignorance, oh sorry, the cause of our suffering, namely the ignorance, will gradually dissipate. Now I must point out at this point that for the Buddha this is not a hypothesis. I'm, I'm framing this argument as if this were a hypothesis. And I think it's valid to say it is in terms of each one of us as we come to the Dhamma. Because when we come, we're encouraged to be skeptical. We're encouraged to question. We're encouraged, as I I will read in a later quote by Goenkaji, for us also to behave like research scientists and discover the truth for ourselves. So I think it's valid to say that for each one of us when we come to a course, the second and third noble truth actually form a hypothesis. We do not know the truth of that statement at that point. Logically, it seems consistent, but we haven't experienced it. So now we need an experiment. We need to be able to test the validity of this hypothesis, and that's given in the fourth noble truth. The fourth noble truth, of course, is the eightfold noble path which leads to the cessation of suffering. It's composed of three divisions, the first one being morality. We need to not do things that cause harm to other beings in order to keep our mind calm so that we can accomplish the second objective in the Eightfold Noble Path, which is to concentrate the mind. Concentrate the mind so we can penetrate reality to the depths and observe with equanimity. And by doing that, we develop, in the third division of the Eightfold Noble Path, we develop our wisdom. And by developing our wisdom, of course, we're dispelling the darkness of that ignorance. So we have the experiment to conduct ourselves and the... Fortunately, in places like this, we have the opportunity to come and conduct that experiment under almost ideal circumstances. Now, that's a fairly simple proposition, and I think anyone who's done a course would agree that this fits the bill. This is what we do when we come here. But I also said that by framing this idea by framing this uh, practice that we undertake here in terms of a scientific method, there are some issues that come up that 
need to be distinguished between what we're doing here and the scientific method as it's practiced in the West today. And I bring up some of these issues because when I've talked with other people about this, they have brought up these concerns, and they're concerns that came up in my mind as well. The first is, this experiment is done internally, which is very different from almost the entire realm of the physical sciences and also the social sciences, that we are the subject and we are the object of this experiment. And once again, you'll see the difficulty in talking about subjectivity and objectivity, and that's why I stick to the, the very simple definition of observing things as they are without letting our own predispositions and our own uh, thinking interfere with that process. And I would argue that it's quite similar to what we do in science in a sense because this isn't some idle form of in, intu intuition or um, speculation. This is actually using our physical senses to observe the reality within. And if we can use our physical senses to observe the reality outside, then I think it's no stretch to say that we should be able to observe objectively the uh, sensations within the body. Another difference is, of course, there's no peer review literature. We don't uh, leave here and go running out to publish in uh, scientific journals our experiences of Vipassana meditation. And the purpose of doing that, of course, in science is to let other people know what we're doing so that they can repeat the experiment. <clears throat> and gradually over time, there was one comment made that science evolves, that our notions of science, our theories of science evolve. And the peer review literature is a crucial part of that process. And obviously, we don't do that in Vipassana. <clears throat> However, I appreciate Rick's comments this morning, this whole talk, because the other comment I was going to make about this is, well, we do have the Tibetica. And similarly to my comments that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, we don't, that when we look within, we don't look without, there's a difference here. And the Buddha, of course, didn't frame this whole experiment or this whole, this whole effort as an experiment. So the Tipitaka, too, is not a description of an experiment in that sense. It's a description of the truth. These Four Noble Truths are called the Four Noble Truths. They're not called the Four Noble Hypotheses. <laughs> <laughs> so when we go to the literature, we're actually looking at the results of what the Buddha discovered and handed on to his disciples and then so on down through time to us. But nevertheless, there is a literature there, and I sure that many of you feel, as I do, that Rick's presentation this morning stimulates us all to go and have a deeper look at that. One of the other aspects that comes up is the difference in the fact that science does evolve over time. The, the Buddha's teaching has been constant over 2,500 years. Science continually evolves, continually changes, and hopefully by the process that we're undergoing, and as we can see, the tremendous success of the scientific ex experiment by... Um, the technological world around us, and I'll leave that up to you whether you call that a success or not. Uh, some would argue against it, but nevertheless, it, in a one real sense, it, it demonstrates the success of the scientific method. That is, it works. One other concern that has been raised, and I raised myself, is we don't use scientific instruments in this experiment that we conduct. And I think that could only be phrased in, in modern times because it's only recently that we have abandoned the use of our own physical senses in the sciences. When I was much younger and first, reading, first taking my first courses in science, in chemistry textbooks, methods of identifying compounds were still described as using your senses, your senses of taste, your senses of smell, <laughs> which is something I would never do in the laboratory today. But that was a valid way of identifying compounds in the past. And even today, we still use our visual sense. We still do what is called colorimetry, where we react a certain compound with another reagent that produces a color. And that color can be directly proportional to the amount of compound that's present in a solution. <clears throat> 
And so we can use our visual sense of color to determine whether there is that compound present and to what degree. So I'd argue that the use of scientific instruments then is, is not really a valid <coughs> criticism. But more than that, LeMay started to get into a little bit yesterday about our senses and how they work. I think sometimes we forget with all these scientific instruments just what a wonderful scientific instrument we inhabit. And there was a table that LeMay handed out yesterday and she graciously chose not to go through it because I said that was something I would do. (laughs) She mentioned, however, our sensitivity of touch and she used an example that is in a what's called a table of thresholds. These are, it's very complicated how these are determined. And I would also mention that these are very descriptive analogies that illustrate the, what has been discovered by very intensive research. That we can perceive the wing of a bee falling on our back from a height of one centimeter. That's pretty sensitive. There's one that I was, uh, an example I was given when I was young in school. Take a human hair. Next time you brush your hair, just take one human hair and rub it between your fingers and see what it feels like. It doesn't feel all that fine. It feels like a piece of rope between your fingers. Well, my wife gave me a set of calipers for Christmas, and I put it to use. I measured the diameter of one of my human hairs. (laughs) It's two one-thousandths of an inch. And that's not even approaching the limit of our sensitivity. And also, has, as was mentioned yesterday by LeMay, with practice, our sense of touch becomes much more refined. And we've all probably, who have conducted the experiment of Vipassana here at the center, noticed that. Our other, our other senses are dramatically sensitive as well. We can perceive a single candle burning. If we could set up this experiment on a completely dark night with no wind, we could perceive a single candle burning at 30 miles. And how that is determined is we can detect a single photon. Remember, we were talking about the star experiment that you're all going to conduct later in the month. A single photon impacting the retina and the eye is enough for us to perceive light in the dark sensitized eye. Not only that, our eye can perceive 340,000 different combinations of color and intensity. I don't know who, who may be scientists here or who plays around with spreadsheets, but you can think of the combinations of color and intensity on two axes of a graph. On your spreadsheets, you'd have to set up an array 600 wide, 600 entries wide and 600 entries long. One of the problems of being a scientist is we need to understand our data, and that would be almost impossible to understand an array of that order. Our other senses, we could hear the tick of a watch at 20 feet. One of the problems, we, most of us don't have watches that tick anymore, but I don't know how they determined that one. But again, we, we can determine about the same array, about 340,000 different frequencies of sound and intensities of sound. Interestingly, the senses of sight or the senses of taste and smell aren't as dramatic. We don't seem to use those as much in our world. I guess they haven't been as crucial to our evolution. However, we can detect a single teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water, or we could smell one drop of perfume in a three-room apartment, probably uh, half the size of this room. Another thing we can do is if you hold up your thumb your thumb in terms of angle of visual acuity is about two degrees. Each degree in uh, in that particular angle is comprised of 60 minutes. Each minute is comprised of 60 seconds. So your thumb is comprised of 7,600 seconds of arc. Well, we can perceive half a second of arc, which means that (laughs) If you hold up your thumb and imagine, we could distinguish 14,000 
different lines making up our thumb, which is an incredible sensitivity. So I think, I hope you would agree (laughs) that as far as perception goes, as far as the first part of perception goes, we do have a pretty darn good scientific instrument. But then what about processing the data? How does that work? Because after all, we not only need to take the data in, we need to process it. That's accomplished through the nervous system. The elementary components of the nervous system, of course, are neurons, the individual nerve cells. And there are specialized nerve cells for every sense that detect the incoming information. In the sense of light, of course, would be electromagnetic radiation, strikes the retina and the eyeball. And the specialized nerve cells there convert that electromagnetic signal into an electric signal. An electric potential actually is sent down the body of the nerve cell and then converted to chemical energy in the synapse to signal the next neuron to fire and so on as that signal is passed up to our brain. Those signals reach our brain, are sent to the cerebral cortex where they are assembled on what are called primary projection areas, which are mappings of those signals that represent the reality that we see or the reality that we hear. Now, the interesting thing is nobody knows where this great hologram that's going on in our heads is actually playing. We think we see things outside, but in fact, these are all a representation that's being concocted inside us. And at this point, we don't know where that is all happening. But the take-home message here is there's nothing in our understanding of perception, as far as the scientific method goes, that contradicts the Buddha's description of how perception works. Just one more comment about the brain, the central processing unit in our scientific instrument, if we like to call it that. There are in the order of 10 to 100 billion nerve cells in the brain. And each one of those those nerve cells has 5,000 to 50,000 individual connections with other cells. If you are familiar with uh, probability and statistics, you can see that the possible combinations in our brain are almost infinite. There's no computer imaginable that can even come close. So I hope I've dispelled this idea that we need a scientific instrument to look within. We have a wonderful one at our disposal. Finally, I'd like to briefly go over what we learn about the processing of information from the point of view of Vipassana. And that brings us to the five aggregates. Five aggregates are matter and four divisions of the mind, which are consciousness, perception, sensation, and reaction. Matter, of course, corresponds to our physical apparatus, our physical senses. And when, for example, some sound reaches my ear, then what happens? We've already described the process. The signal, in scientific terms, goes to our brain. In the Buddhist term, we simply have consciousness that something is happening at the ear sense door. Let's use an example. Somebody says something to me. I'm aware that there's something happening at the sense door of the ear, and I hear words. Goenkaji uses the term words of praise as an example. I'll say, somebody says, I love you. Well, what happens? It doesn't stop at just the perception of the words, I love you. Immediately, the next part of the mind engages. Recognize those words and says, oh, I like this very much. (laughs) And instantly, there are pleasant sensations on my body. And we know from the practice of Vipassana, of course, that it's those sensations that we react to, and that reaction then becomes the sakharas that hopefully as time goes on, these mental conditionings will arise and pass away, similar to how matter is arising and passing away. So I think it's fair to say there's no real contradiction between our notions of perception in terms of Vipassana and the notions of perception in the scientific world. I hope I've convinced you that 
we live in a reasonably wonderful scientific instrument and that um, we can conduct this experiment ourselves, that it can be framed in terms of the scientific method. There are some differences between the scientific method as it's practiced today and this experiment. But the important aspects of the experiment are still there, that we can observe reality within, we know the hypothesis, and we can conduct the experiment. In closing, I'd just like to outline a few ways in which it is important that we develop this sense of objectivity. And I think, as a scientist, not only am I curious about these correlations between the scientific method and Vipassana, but I'm also concerned that what I do in terms of Vipassana improves every aspect of my life, so therefore it must improve my life as a scientist. And I think it doesn't take any deep thought to realize that science can get us into a lot of trouble. And on this earth, we certainly have done that. That has happened as a result of our sanya, I would say, our judgment, our not using our objective faculties to the full. And that happens in the scientific world. This peer review process isn't perfect. We've tried in our research group to publish a couple of papers that we felt were pretty darn uh, defensible, but we came up against, in the, in the peer review process, some prejudice against our conclusions. Well, fortunately, science evolves. Time will tell whether those notions that we've come up with are valid, but I think it's, it's important to realize that even within the scientific community, there's a need to develop this objectivity, and that no doubt all of science would benefit if science did this, scientists did this practice as well. Out there in the world, of course, when science gets applied, there are numerous examples of problems. One thing that we observe in, in the press lately is in the world of cigarette companies, where science is done, a lot of science is done in corporations, by the way, not just in academic communities, but there's a real danger there because greed factor, of course, is at play. And I I don't think that we can necessarily think that these are all evil people. Quite often, as we discover through Vipassana, and as LeMay pointed out, a lot of our actions are done on the subconscious level. We're not even aware of what we're doing. But nevertheless, the application of technology in the modern world, I think one of the questions that came up yesterday was, are we heading towards a better world or a worse world as a result? And uh, I'm quite ambivalent on that. I'm not sure. But I am absolutely sure that the practice of Vipassana will not only benefit us all in terms of how science is applied in the world, but as we all know, it is the path that leads to our ultimate liberation from suffering. And as I began the talk, I'll end it. That, of course, is far more important than any of these other considerations although I do hope that this has been stimulating in some way. And I would like to close with another quotation from Goenkaji. The first one was about the Buddha. The second one is an exhortation to us to continue. Like the Buddha, one should also be a scientist of the world within in order to experience truth directly. Personal realization of truth will automatically change the habit pattern of the mind. If we become scientists of the reality within, we shall make proper use of science for the happiness of all. Thank you. Peter? This doesn't seem fair somehow to have to start up again after lunch. (laughs) However, I would be glad to answer any questions. Yes. The question is, how does the objectivity that I have hopefully developed in this practice uh, affect 
uh, my work in the laboratory and also the peer review process. In the laboratory, there's no doubt that objectivity is extremely important. As you conduct experiments, one thing I didn't mention in talking about scientific uh, instrumentation is, of course, there's something called noise. Scientific instruments aren't perfect replicators of phenomena. And so the data that you get isn't an exact representation of the phenomena that, are, phenomena that are going on. So as you look at your data, the question is, how do you interpret it? And when you see anomalies, do you keep them? Do you reject them? Of course, there are rules for doing that. But by developing objectivity, there's an important thing that happens, and that is that you start losing your attachment to how the experiment comes out. And I think that's absolutely crucial for a scientist. I mentioned a, a couple of examples of corporate science, if we can call it that. And of course, there, there are overriding or underlying um, influences that on a very overt level can influence how the data is interpreted. So absolutely, developing objectivity is crucial in science. And as far as the peer review process, uh, I, I can't say that it would be any different in that process. For, for me personally, as I said earlier to somebody here, it's actually dealing with the terror of the, the peer review process that probably is, is uh, something that comes to mind more readily as a direct benefit of practicing Vipassana because, of course, Vipassana goes way beyond all of these issues to purification of the entire being and being able to observe terror and still stand up and give a talk, for example, is very, is very helpful. <laughs> Yes. Let me say in question, it uh, affects people. People, it's very complicated, mm -hmm. each by itself. Right. Have you been able to measure how it affects uh, different people and what processes, how to measure? <coughs> the question is, uh, Vipassana affects people in many different ways. We, we have plenty of evidence from students' testimonies that they are affected by this. And the question is, are there any ways that have been measured and recorded to uh, indicate what that, those kind of changes might be? Uh, LeMay mentioned yesterday uh, the fact that we are conducting courses in prisons. It's been happening in India to a large extent and also here in the, in the, the United States. And some measures have been attempted. One that she mentioned was recidivism, the, the rate at which students who undertake courses end up back in prison at a later time. And I forget the exact numbers, but I think it was from something like 75% to 40-something percent. There was a significant drop in the recidivism rate. But she also pointed out that um, those numbers are skewed because some of the people are still in prison. They haven't gone out yet and haven't come back. So that, that little anecdote just illustrates a problem that how, what do you measure? And this is a concern that I have. I've thought about this a lot. You know, being a scientist, what kind of experiment could I, or what kind of survey could I design that might be very helpful to illustrate to people? Because obviously, when people obviously when people come and start looking at vipassana, they have questions. They want to know. Well, does this really work? Can you convince me that this is really mm -hmm. worthwhile? So I think it would be a worthwhile project to do that. And I haven't been able to really come up in my own mind, and I haven't heard anybody else come up with you know, a set of parameters that we could put down and investigate. And the question is, how would you do it? I mean, in the social sciences, I'm not a social scientist, but I know a common uh, modality is to use double-blind studies. Well, how would you do that in Vipassana? <laughs> would you bring in one group of people and just stick them out in their tents and let them stay there for 10 days? <laughs> and the other group, come on in, we'll teach you meditation. I mean, <laughs> Uh, obviously, we're not going to do that. Uh, so I, it's, it's a great question because it, it brings up the whole point of how, how can we communicate to people with some scientific basis that, yes, these, these are the types of changes that can take place. But 
the best that I know so far, and the, the most effective, seems to be anecdotal evidence. And that is the spread by word of mouth, you know, one person telling another, well, look, this is what I experienced. And, and there you not only get the data, and this is one of the problems I have with science. <laughs> science tends to be very dry in this sense, that when you're reacting face-to-face, -face, there's so much more going on. And LeMay spoke about this yesterday as well, you know, these dynamic interactions and that there's so much more communication going on. And I think that's a really important part of how people learn, does Vipassana really work? It's that kind of empathy that you may feel coming through from that individual. So I, I don't know if anybody else, I, I don't know if any of the other presenters have more experience with that, but that's what I know. So the question is, <laughs> one of compliance. Uh, the observation is made that um, this person has talked with a number of students here who have done several or four or five courses, and that they find it very difficult to keep up their daily practice. And is there some way, perhaps, that we can enhance this process of um, as it was, the term that was used is compliance. Well, <clears throat> that's a wonderful question. <laughs> and in my own personal history, I wish that I had better compliance when I first started. <laughs> um, but of course, in this tradition, uh, compliance perhaps is an inappropriate word because it's all from the, uh, what's the word I want? Motivation of the student, what happens? We simply set up an environment here that, to the best of our ability, provides an ideal setting for undertaking this particular practice. Of course, while the student is here, there are very strict rules and regulations because, number one, we don't want a student or a group of students disturbing the other students. So there's a code of conduct while people are here. And then we simply pack up the schedule. You're busy for 12 hours a day. Uh, there are food breaks and a break to sleep at night. But otherwise, it's simply full-on meditation. And the reason for that schedule and the practice is that within 10 days, there's the opportunity and the likelihood that somebody who works diligently and seriously and correctly will experience something quite profound, will experience to some depth, the reality of the world within, have some experience of anicca, have some experience of a lessening of, as we've called them, some kind of parameter, some uh, suffering, some anxiety, whatever, a reduction in the suffering. And that ultimately has to be the motivation for the student to continue on. If they've somehow tasted the results, the fruits of this Dhamma, that alone should be enough to spur them on. However, the reality is, is exactly as you say. It's very, very difficult in the early stages to maintain the practice. And the only thing I can say from my experience is that what I found personally was when I made the decision to take a part of my life, period of my life, of course I had the opportunity to do it, which was most fortunate, was to work seriously for an intense period of time doing courses and serving courses. And by doing that, and I, I found this is the experience of many, many students, that that helps greatly in getting established. Simply doing a course and then going away, coming back some months later, doing a course, going away, maybe coming back years later and doing another course. It's very, very difficult to maintain the practice. The reason for that, of course, is that there are many influences out there in the world, and we all live very busy lives, and it's very easy for us to get caught up in the world again and get out of the practice. After all, the practice requires, for those who have not taken a course, the requirement is to, not the requirement, I mean, it's up to the individual, but uh, to really maintain the practice, the requirement is to practice an hour in the morning and an hour at night every day. And people find that very difficult to find that time in their lives. But those who do find the benefits are so extraordinary, the depth of the practice becomes so profound that it reaches a point where there's no question of turning back. There's no question of not doing it. But I, I don't know of any way other than communicating this, you know, and ma making 
students aware that there are these difficulties, and Goenkaji does that in his discourses. He explains that he uses the analogy of a little seedling, that you know, the seedling of Dhamma is just starting to grow. And there are so many pests and so many animals that can take that away. And so you have to put a fence around that little plant and protect it until it grows to the point where now it can survive on its own. Just a hypothetical example that person attained one 10 day session. And then after practicing maybe for a couple of minutes or maybe a couple of months, we just give it up. Isn't there still some permanent uh, change in your behavior which is kind of you know, built into your uh, subconscious mind? So maybe you don't jump to the conclusion or you listen to people more. Some built in things so that at least there is some benefit which might be lasting for a while, mm-hmm. or, if, or if you don't practice for two, three months, it's completely gone and your 10 days are wasted or what? <laughs> so the question is a hypothetical one, but a wonderful one. <laughs> the question is, if somebody takes a course and maybe keeps their practice up for a week or so afterwards, and then loses the practice, stops practicing. Is there some ongoing benefit that happens as a result of this, or is it just gone? Goenkaji very often says, no effort goes waste on this path. Nothing is lost. And I think that's very encouraging for anybody who has suffered through a 10-day course. (laughs) To know that that effort that you have made is not going to go to waste. Most definitely, because if you have any kind of realization of the truth within as a result of that course, this is bound to have a profound effect on your outlook. But more importantly, if you've worked properly, you've started to unwind this process of creating sankharas, creating more and more mental impurities. And every iota of the stock of sankharas that get peeled away is to your benefit. I can't say specifically, but of course, let's just use the example of anger. If during the course you find that so much anger comes up and you've developed equanimity, you've developed some balance towards that anger, and you've noticed that it has subsided somewhat, I have no qualms in saying that that benefit will be with you, that you have started to reduce it. But I must also add that if you then go back into the old habits, if, say, after a week or so you just come out of your practice, you may still have that benefit. But if a month or so later you start reacting and uh, encouraging, indulging in this anger towards others, well, you're starting to go in the opposite direction again. You're starting to create more sankaras, and there's no doubt that at some point that's going to overshadow the benefits. But still... The benefits from every step on the path are there. Yes. So the question relates to the social responsibility of a scientist, how that works, how that's developed, and also the suggestion that that be contrasted to the kind of um, sense of personal responsibility that comes from actually engaging in the practice of vipassana. It's curious, and I'm not sure why it is, but I've noticed in the scientific community, 
at least in the academic setting, it's, it's the sphere of my experience, is there's quite an idealism among a lot of the scientists that perhaps it comes from almost a childlike curiosity about the world and wanting to explore and play around in a laboratory and make discoveries and learn how the world works. That along with that is some notion that what we are doing is actually benefiting society, not just is this a, an endeavor, a livelihood that I can engage in to keep me going and body and soul, but to also provide some benefit for the society at large. Now, the problem with that is, is that without real wisdom, those kind of notions can often be misguided. I've often wondered how a wonderful human being, an apparently wonderful human being like Albert Einstein, could have engaged in research that ended up basically in the production of atomic and nuclear weapons. But again, I, I think the example of naivety may be there, that I'm sure if he had known early on what the consequences were, that things might have developed very differently. So I think it's absolutely crucial that scientists, especially, but everybody, of course, engage in this introspection within, this development of wisdom within, so that no matter what the walk of life, it doesn't, it shouldn't, we shouldn't restrict this discussion just to scientists, but people in all walks of life, there are many, many consequences of the things that we do. In science, there are many consequences. I've chosen to be an environmental uh, chemist for precisely those reasons that I feel that there's a chance that I'm doing something for the social benefit as opposed to developing another chemical that's going to end up in the environment poisoning everybody, <laughs> even though there may be uh, some wonderful use for that chemical. So I think in order to make those decisions, it's important to have some clarity within and also some wisdom within. Um, one of the topics that I didn't get into that I was going to was that not only is there a problem in research in general with um, mo um, competing motivations, say, influencing what we do and how we do it, but there's also the ethical questions that are coming up today. We're, our technology is so powerful, and we're on the verge of a revolution in the health sciences where genetic material is being manipulated. Um, very recently I heard in the news that human embryo cells may be very useful in uh, certain treatments. But these types of endeavors bring up such thorny ethical problems. And how do we resolve those ethical problems? How do we sort through the possibilities and the likelihood that what we do may actually be used for terrific harm? And then how do we set up control mechanisms so that doesn't happen? Those are difficult questions, and I think the only hope that we have, really, is that the people who make those decisions are very clear in their thinking, very objective in their thinking. And we know that the way to develop that clarity and objectivity, one way, the way that we know, is through Vipassana meditation. <laughs>